All right, good evening, everybody. Um, I've been drafted or chosen to lead us off. What I'm going to do is talk more about, um, you know, the history of sports from the post-war period to now in brief, just to set the stage for some of the things that my colleagues are going to discuss. Uh, I want to say up front, before I get into that, I know the title is Pro Sports and it's Professional Sports, but I also want to say that I'm pro sports from the beginning, right? That I, I grew up uh, a sports lover, and to be honest, in the part of, of um, you know, South Louisiana where I lived as a kid, um, sports were our poetry, it was our theater, it was our aesthetics, right? It was something that we were consumed with. And uh, in, a, in a store that, uh, you know, a town that didn't have a, a bookstore or, um, you know, other institutions that might have led to, uh, you know, serious intellectual life, it was what we needed in some ways, right? It helped us to understand um, the broader world and some of its, its uh, conflicts and contradictions, right? So I want to start out by saying I'm a sports fan. And in the spirit of what I did last night, I want to try to point out some of the, the uh, nuances and contradictions to it all. One other you know, uh, point of background, this year I'm actually living in the LA metro area, uh, doing a visiting professorship at Art Center College of Design. So I'm, I'm at a commercial art school. And um, I've been there trying to help the faculty, staff, and students think through um, the social and public cost of the Olympic Games, hosting the Olympic Games. LA is set to host its, its uh, third Olympics uh, in 2028. They'll also play host to uh, some of the World Cup matches in 2026. And so I've been there, you know, doing various events. We, we did a, a lecture series. I've taught courses. Jules was our first speaker, so that was amazing to have him um, in Pasadena. But it's been a great year for me because it's given me a chance to, to sit back, take a break from Chicago uh, in a lot of different respects and have a chance to think about a slightly different subject matter than I've been dealing with uh, for some time. Tons of problems with the Olympics. I'll wait and let, let Jules you know, lead us off in that regard. But I want to take us back to you know, the history of, of sports in this country. And even in the 20th century, when we're talking about sports, right, even professional sports, they began in some regards as working class recreational leagues, right, oftentimes supported by industrialists, we still have the stamp of that on the names of some of these teams in different parts of the country. You know, Steelers, Oilers in Houston at one point, uh, Boilermakers, referring to some dominant industries in different parts of the, uh, the, uh, the nation. Um, but we know that ultimately, many aspects of our economy take a dramatic turn uh, with the changes within uh, manufacturing, right? Um, and I want to I want to focus in on that, like what sports becomes in the age of mass consumer society, how it changes in really subtle ways and some very dramatic ways. Right. One thing that I was able to do this year with students was take them on a tour of the L.A. Coliseum, which is a beautiful uh, facility. Right. And we um, we had a chance to tour it and the students were probably less enthusiastic than I was. Right. Because I remember the 1984 games and I was really into it. But there was one moment when they took us into the uh, luxury boxes, right? Um, and, you know, I think our, our uh, tour guide was a little naive. I hadn't given full disclosure on what we were there to do, what the course was about. And she talked, you know, in really glowing terms about how great this was. She let us enter into these luxury boxes that we could never enter, at least I would never get into these places. But um, we found out, you know, how many incredibly wealthy Angelinos, you know, own these boxes and how much they paid per year, right, to, to keep these spots. I think there was like a 10-year lease on each one of them. I publicized that in an Instagram post, which was almost immediately removed, right, because I tagged, I tagged USC and I tagged a few other institutions within it. Um, but it was, a, it was an important lesson in two things. One. Uh, when that Coliseum was built, it reflected a much more democratic sense of how this thing should work, you know, much more catered towards working class people's uh, incomes and pay structures. And that's true, not only the LA Coliseum, but if you visit the Rose Bowl, 
Um, it's the same sort of structure, very sort of, everybody has a fairly decent sight line in that particular stadium. Um, it's true of the old Soldier Field in Chicago until they totally fucked it up by like landing, you know, upper deck on top of what was this really um, kind of like Greco-Roman style uh, Coliseum, right? Um, those are the, the stadiums that were built in the 1920s. And the ones that are being built today completely uh, reflect a very different um, class structure and, you know, new levels of wealth within the country as well as um, different expectations about who will be the patrons at these, these, uh, these games. So in this, this post-industrial economy, and I'm using that term, like I said last night, in quotation marks, right? We're not, we still have industries. Um, we still have manufacturing. It just takes place in ways that don't require the same quantities of living labor here in the United States or, you know, the same things that we're wearing. I'm sure everybody, not to out everyone, is wearing something that may have been produced in other parts of the world in conditions that we would still call, uh, you know, Fordist. So I think um, I'm using that term to really refer to specific changes that have happened. Other people have referred to it as hyper-industrialization to, to mark um, the aspects of capital intensification. But just as a marker, right? Once we begin to move away from a society where so many Americans are still employed in uh, manufacturing, many more than we see now are covered uh, under unionization, and can enjoy a certain status uh, of uh, working class life, we move into a spot where entertainment, tourism, uh, leisure activities really explode, right, during the post-war years. I talked about some of that last night. And so we, we move into a space where um, not only does sports become bigger business than it was before, right, um, but the, the, the dynamics change dramatically, especially when we get to the 1980s, right? And I'm sure people in here can recall how different it was um, to attend baseball games and other events in the 70s and earlier. Uh, one of my good friends, John Garlock uh, in Rochester, labor historian, used to talk about being at Ebbets Field in, in New York and how you could actually hear people talking on the infield, right, when you're sitting in the stands. Now when you go to a game, and I went to one of the White Sox games in Chicago a few weeks ago, you're bombarded, right, constantly by all sorts of, uh, you know, stimuli um, I couldn't even count how many different concessions there were, the variety of concessions in this stadium. And it really felt like almost walking through a shopping mall versus an athletic, um, you know, facility. What we've also seen, and this is a result of these changes, you know, as cities are bleeding manufacturing jobs, um, many mayors and city councils, oftentimes, you know, uh, black political regimes that had taken over major cities, we're now faced in the 1970s, 80s with the predicament of how do you attract investment um, when capital is mobile, but cities are not, right? And so how do you, how do you figure out ways to lure uh, investment you know, back to places like Cleveland or um, you know, Atlanta and all sorts of other uh, locales? And so what we see over time is cities beginning to cater completely to incentivizing um, you know, sports. If they don't have athletic teams, they're trying to lure them in. Once they have them, they're trying to keep them. And these cities go to great lengths to, uh, to make sure that this, that this happens, right? So I'll give you a couple of quick examples. One that is um, I'm totally conflicted about, and I'll put my cards on the table. Uh, the other one I'm less conflicted about, and, and it's one that we should really be on guard for. So the first example will be from New Orleans. I grew up in Louisiana and have been a Saints fan as far back as I can, can remember. So I want to talk about New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina briefly, and then I also want to talk about Chicago in the context of our new, um, newly elected mayor. So after Hurricane Katrina, right, the Superdome, which is like one of the most iconic buildings, not just in New Orleans, but in the state of Louisiana, um, it's a building that I feel attached to because every Thanksgiving holiday, right, the day after Thanksgiving, you know, Black Friday, we would travel to New Orleans for the Bayou Classic uh, football game, which was a match between 
Southern University, which is my alma mater, and Grambling State, which was the up, upstate uh, black school, right? And it was a massive event, you know, more than 70,000 people in the actual game and many thousands more who just come to town for other events that are happening that weekend. It was a place where I actually saw uh, Doug Williams, we were just talking about, you know, the first black quarterback to win a Super Bowl uh, with Washington. I saw him play as a collegiate student, right? I met people like Eddie Robinson as a kid, who was the winningest coach in college football until they allowed Paterno to keep his title despite his, his transgressions, right? But the Superdome is like an, is a building that a lot of people have affection for in Louisiana because of the great concerts, because of great events that have been held there. It was damaged by Hurricane Katrina, both by the force of hurricane winds. It was also damaged by the fact that it was used as a shelter of last resort, right? You know, New Orleans undertook the worst kind of capitalist planning for the Katrina disaster. They did not um, think carefully about those persons who didn't own cars, people who were primarily renters, people who were on public assistance and were waiting for their checks to arrive, you know, uh, within a day of when the, the uh, hurricane made landfall and the city became uh, inundated after the failure of levees. And so you had a, a really uh, haphazard, you know, and, and thoughtless um, preparation. So you had a, a Superdome that was being used. There's no chemical toilets you know, available for people. There's no dedicated security. There's no, uh, you know, first aid or first responders de designated to that spot. And so eventually the, the, the conditions deteriorate, you know, quickly, fairly quickly within the Superdome. So when people evacuate finally, it's, it's in bad shape, right? Um, the state of Louisiana then has to face the Benson family, right, the owners of the Saints franchise, who, who begin threatening to leave and to move somewhere else. And for many, uh, you know, people in New Orleans, but also throughout the state, this would have been a disaster, right, or a, a, a disaster that compounds um, the catastrophic flooding of the city. So Louisiana makes multiple rounds of overly generous concessions to the Benson family. Just one example, they actually uh, allowed the Benson family to purchase a building which had been many different things. It had been an office complex, it had been a shopping mall. Uh, I think at one point part of it was a hotel. They allowed them to purchase this building, you know, at like, you know, bargain basement prices. And then they proceeded to move all of the Louisiana state offices into that building to provide, you know, immediate and continuous revenue to the Benson family going forward, right? They also paid for all sorts of upgrades to get the, the uh, Superdome back up and, and running because it is such an important cornerstone of the New Orleans economy, which is, is largely and almost exclusively a tourism-driven economy, right? Shipbuilding, which was once there, is not, you know, the Avondale shipyard shut down in the years after Katrina. And even the port system, you know, again, in this post-industrial or post fortis context, doesn't rely on large-scale uh, quantities of work um, because of containerization and other, other technological changes. And so it's very much a city that rises and falls on tourism. And those weekends where the Saints play home games are always an important uh, booster. I just found out recently that the state has pledged, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 400 million for new upgrades because they're going to host the Super Bowl in 2025, um, right? And I think this will be, um, I don't know if it's maybe the seventh time the city has hosted the Super Bowl. They also host the Sugar Bowl and all sorts of other uh, major events like the, the Final Four, right, you know, in, in college basketball. But you get a clear sense of how, you know, sports teams are able to reorient the priorities of cities. Last night we were talking about police budgets, and I don't want anybody to misread me. You know, there's some police budgets that are bloated and that need to be cut and should be dealt with. But I think on the left, we should also be thinking about the growth regime within these cities more broadly, not just the police budgets, but all sorts of other, uh, you know, land grants, infrastructure improvements, sweetheart deals, um, 
you know, tax incentives that are used to cajole and keep athletics franchises and to try to lure uh, various kinds of, of investment. That should be our focus, but we don't really get unnerved by that. We don't get as upset by that as we are by, by you know, the police budget, which when you stack it up alongside of some of these things is, is a problem, but not as, as, um, as big of a problem as we might, we might imagine, right? It's part of a bigger uh, set of issues. Um, as you all know, and I've been enthusiastic about this, uh, the election of Brandon Johnson as the new mayor, uh, I was talking to somebody earlier on a podcast, and uh, she's tried to steal some of my enthusiasm about it, and was more cynical than I was, which was, was interesting but, uh, at times. But I've been happy about Brandon Johnson because I think you know his election has been a long time in the making, right? I think many of us who were in Chicago back during uh, Rahm Emanuel's re-election campaign really hope that Karen Lewis, who was then the president of the Chicago Teachers Union, was going to mount a challenge to Rahm Emanuel. And unfortunately, she got a cancer diagnosis, uh, and that you know, derailed those immediate plans. Chuy Garcia stepped up as uh, a challenger, but did not, you know, did not really um, dethrone Rahm Emanuel. Lori Lightfoot. You know, took over later. She was successfully elected. Some people imagined her to be uh, some progressive left candidate that she was not. Um, they read her identity, you know, as a black queer uh, woman, as somehow indicative of her politics. But she was just as deeply committed to um, this neoliberal, you know, growth regime in the city as anyone else. And when she came in, she immediately signed on, um, even after expressing some misgivings about it to two mega development projects that would create all new neighborhoods in Chicago, right? One near the Goose Island area, which is an old, you know, brownfield area, and another just south of Roosevelt Road, right? So I was done with Lori Lightfoot from the beginning. I wasn't excited about her. But with Brandon Johnson, we got somebody with a totally different pedigree, right? He was someone who had been a school teacher, someone who identified at least at one point, I don't know if he'll still say this as a democratic socialist, um, and, and a person who's, I, I met him once, right? Someone who seemed, you know, uh, serious about the changes he's calling for on the campaign trail. There was one unfortunate moment, however, during the, the, um, the final round of debates, right? And for people who are not familiar with this, this last election, um, this was really the first election that I've ever participated in as an adult. And I'm, I'm about to turn 52 uh, in, a, in a couple months. First election I've been in at the mayoral level where there was a real choice, right? Where we're choosing between, uh, again, this democratic socialist, progressive left guy, and on the other side, a Republican school privatizer. Um, and so it was an important election. But when we had one of those last mayoral debates, the issue of the Bears comes up, the Chicago Bears. And the Bears' ownership has been threatening to leave the city for Arlington Heights, which is a suburb uh, northwest of O'Hare Airport. And for a long time, right, um, they've been threatening. And a lot of these, a lot of these, these uh, you know, organizations do this. And, and it's one way to extort money from, from the cities where they reside. They threaten to leave Soldier Field. Lori Lightfoot put out multiple projects, you know, multi, one, some were like, I think one with the lowest estimate was 900 million. And then there were others that ran into the billions for how they would renovate Soldier Field to meet the needs of, um, of the Bears organization. In this last debate, however, with Brandon Johnson and Paul Vallis, they asked the question, would you, you know, what would you do? Or would you be willing to spend city money to keep the bears. Paul Vallis says straight away, you know, in the Republican fashion, no way, right? We're not gonna allow the taxpayers to, you know, to foot the bill for the bears. If they wanna move to Arlington Heights, they should. Brandon Johnson then, who's our guy, says, well, you know, I grew up with the 1980s bears and everybody loved those bears back then. I don't know about folks in Seattle, but Walter Payton, they were like these larger than life figures. Um, yeah, so everybody has this nostalgia for them, especially in Chicago. They're still riding off that championship because they haven't had one since. 
And he says, I love that team, and I want to be able to go to Soldier Field with my kids. And it was so deflating to hear that, right? Because I'm like, that is not the right talking point, right, for us. It should be straight away. Who gives a shit what the, you know, the Bears franchise wants to do? Let them leave the city if they have to. Let's focus on what we can do to improve the lives for people who live here. Let's deal with real issues like, you know, reducing um, crime in the city, which is an issue more so than it is in, in L.A. And, and New York City. Let's figure out ways to deal with the inequality that exists in, in uh, Chicago. So it was a disappointing moment, but I think it's a, it's a broader problem for us and maybe a blind spot for many people on the left, not talking actively, you know, except in these episodic moments about the contradictions of sports franchises, how they're connected to these broader urban growth regimes, and what we should be doing to change the conversation and move us in a different direction and create cities that are actually for us, not just simply for, um, you know, the investor class, right? So I'll stop there because I'm probably going over my, my time, but I'm anxious to hear what my, what my colleagues have to say. So thank you all. Well, before I get started, I just want to follow Cedric and say that I, too, am not a grumpadelic academic <laughs> with a knee-jerk built-in penchant for trashing sports. I mean, I participated in sports. I have played professional soccer, uh, played actually maybe my best game ever down the road at Key Arena mm. on a day that Ziggy Marley actually pat patted me on my back. We were staying in the same hotel. Wow. Of course, I couldn't replicate that at <laughs> all the games. So anyways, I have some really positive memories of playing soccer right here in Seattle. The second thing I want to just say is that for the purposes of analytical precision, I'm going to focus in my remarks here on the Olympic Games, but I do want to say that a lot of what I'll be talking about in terms of the Olympics apply to the World Cup of soccer, mm -hmm. as well as in certain ways what Cedric was pointing to about cities and states supporting sports, professional sports franchises to prevent them from leaving with taxpayer money. There's some overlaps there that we can maybe tease out in the discussion when we all get a chance to weigh in. But I want to just point out for starters that when it comes to the Olympics, there is a lot of money flowing through the system. And on this chart, you can see that nine out of every $10 that flows into the coffers of the International Olympic Committee the group that oversees the Olympic Games. Nine out of every $10 comes from two sources, television broadcast revenues and corporate sponsorships. So there's some behemoth power brokers in society that have lined up in favor of pulling off these Olympic Games. Of course, they're also socially quite popular. There's been studies where they flash the Olympic rings to people and in a kind of astounding nine out of 10 people can actually recognize what the Olympic rings are higher than other logos that are out there. So one sort of provocative remark that I agree with comes from the former co-chair of the Democratic Socialists of America in Portland, Olivia Kotby, and you can see up on screen, she said, just my opinion, but socialists need to get more into sports if you want to reach the masses. Sorry, you're all jocks now, don't, don't cancel me. <laughs> and I do agree, that, and my experience definitely supports this, that sliding into talking about sports can be a way of opening up political conversations that have, would have otherwise be almost impossible. Before I started writing about sports and politics, I wrote about the suppression of political dissent in North America, and try to start a conversation with a conservative member of your family about the suppression of the American Indian movement, you're probably not gonna get too far, at least I didn't, um, but if you wanna talk about public ownership of the Green Bay Packers with my uncles in Wisconsin, you can have a really good conversation about that and actually have some overlaps that you agree on. So I wanna just sort of start off by giving you a couple snapshots from recent Olympic history that kind of set the table for understanding what this group, the International Olympic Committee is and their mentality. First of all, this is a guy, John Coates, a big honcho in Australian Olympic circles, who also is a longtime member and vice president at the International Olympic Committee. He's not exactly known for being a guy who's uh, modest. He said he wrote, him, he wrote himself that he was the best and perfect candidate to become a member of the group that oversees the upcoming Brisbane 2032 Olympics. So my point is the hubris rolling through these circles 
is pretty monumental. Second, you may remember the recent Tokyo Summer Olympics that were postponed one year because of coronavirus. Ahead of those Olympics, a big newspaper in Japan, Asahi Shimbun, did a poll of people in Japan asking them if they wanted to host the Olympics even a year later. 83% said no. They were under vaccinated at the time and they didn't want to have a bunch of people coming into the country even if they were athletes and sports administrators and possibly spreading coronavirus. And then there were some that were just against the Olympics for some of the reasons that I'll be talking about today. But you know those Olympics happened anyways, and that's because there's a provision in the host city contract that all cities sign, including Los Angeles, coming up in 2028, that says that it's the International Olympic Committee that has the power to decide whether to cancel the Olympics, not the host city or country, not the Prime Minister of Japan, who had to actually admit that in public, that he didn't have the power to cancel the games, even if he wanted to honor the, the ideas of his, of his uh, electorate. Third, the International Olympic Committee does not care very much about the city once it is done. An example is the Rio Olympics. Like many cities that I'll talk about, they went into debt to create the Olympics. They were experiencing a wider political and economic crisis at this time. And they had $32 million in debts that needed to be paid immediately. So they turned to the International Olympic Committee, which has billions in its coffers, and asked for $32 million. They're like, hey, we just went out on a limb during a huge crisis. Can you help us out? The International Olympic Committee said, no, we cannot. We're done. And at the same time, you can see the contradiction. They were also building themselves a fancy new headquarters in Lausanne, Switzerland, where they are based. The last snapshot I just want to point out before going through some of the trends with the Olympic Games is that even people that have supported the Olympics, this is a guy named Zev Yaroslavsky who is on the, he was on the Los Angeles City Council back in the day when they hosted the 1984 Games. And I was on a radio show with him recently when he said this, I'm not sure we'll get the audio, no, but I did have, anyways, that he said, you can see on the screen, he says, you don't sign a, a blank check to the International Olympic Committee. He ran by the host city contract that Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti signed with the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, and he said that the people that he turned to about it would not have signed it in the public, I'm sorry, in the private sphere, and yet the, our public officials in LA did. Another big theme I want to talk about is the rise of anti-Olympics activism. It's become stronger and stronger through time. Yes, there are powerful corporations that bolster the Olympics. This is just some of the worldwide partners. They pay millions upon millions to be official sponsors of the Olympics. But they've also, because some of these behemoths have pretty dodgy track records when it comes to human rights, when it comes to the production of their goods, they've actually been sort of a source of anti-Olympics fight back. But I thought it might be helpful to kind of lay out some of the wider trends with the Olympics so you can see why all these activists around the world are coming up against the gains. One of those is escalating costs. I call this Etch-a-Sketch economics, where during the bid phase of the Olympics, cities say that the gains are only gonna cost so much, but over time, the price tag inevitably expands. And I am not exaggerating, it always expands. There's studies that come out every two years from Oxford University that looks at the bid price and then the final price and it's always more, going back to 1960. A couple examples of this, the London Olympics of 2012, when they were bidding, they said it was only gonna cost $3.8 billion. It ended up costing $18 billion. And that's not even to say what Sky Sports, who did a different estimate, who said it was $38 billion. The watchdog group, the anti-Olympics watchdog group, estimated at $21 billion, because they included the transport costs that were necessary to carry off the games. Sochi in Russia, they were supposed to cost 12 billion, they cost 51 billion, more than all previous Winter Olympics combined. Rio, same thing, 12 billion, they ended up costing more like 20 billion. Pyeongchang Winter Olympics, thank you. Six billion was the original price tag, they ended up costing double that. Tokyo, they were supposed to cost 7.3 billion dollars, they probably cost closer to $30 billion at the end of the day, and only a small portion of that was because of the delay in the game. So you get the picture, Beijing, 
uh, similar, although it's very difficult to find out exactly what the numbers are. They're a little bit more opaque. That's why we don't have really precise numbers for 2008 Olympics in Beijing, nor 2022. Relatedly, there's this idea of the white elephant stadium. You build it, but then you don't use it that much, and it becomes obsolete, and yet the public typically has to use taxpayer money to keep it up in case somebody does come and wants to do a performance or a game there. The Pyeongchang 2018 Winter Olympics built this stadium for more than $100 million, only to use it four times and then bang it down. That's what it looks like more today. And basically creating stadiums as if they were disposable coffee cups. They also built an optional ski run. They had two pretty good ski runs, but instead they built a new ski run that made the Olympic standard through a very sensitive environmental area on a place called Mount Gari Wong that was actually a sacred forest, an old growth forest of 500 years. Boom, chopped it down to use a ski run that is hardly used anymore because it's such a difficult run that really you have to be an excellent skier. It's not for your average skier to use. Rio, these pictures come only a couple months after the Rio Olympics in 2016. They were, as I mentioned, already in an economic crisis and these immediately fell into disrepair. They had to build specialized stadiums such as this one uh, for the whitewater canoe event and there's just not a huge bunch of people inside of Brazil that are engaged in canoeing at this level and so it fell into disrepair. Same thing with Athens, 2004. One of the most interesting examples of, of a facility that fell into disrepair that actually ended up having a social use was in 2006 in Turin. They hosted the Winter Olympics. They built this fancy new place for the, it's called the Olympic Village where the athletes stayed during the games, fell into disrepair, and then it was squatted by activists who turned the Olympic Village into a safe space for refugees and others who didn't have homes at the time. And so that's probably the best use, although it was definitely not in the bid plan of the official organizers. Another trend is the militarization of public space. Essentially, the security forces in the city and country that are hosting the Olympics use the games like their own private cash machine, getting all the special funds and weapons that they'd never be able to get during normal political times. So they leverage the state of exception Sometimes they do things like conflate terrorism and activism. The image you can see on screen is from the 2016 Rio bid book that literally had a section called activist and terrorist risks and admitted there was no real threat of terrorism in the country, but that there were a lot of activists and therefore we're going to need to bolster up our weapons. This is a photograph from London. They literally ratcheted surface-to-air missiles on top of apartment complexes. I interviewed some of the people, I was living in London at that time, who learned that they had surface-to-air missiles on their apartment complexes because they had a little slip of paper slid under their door letting them know that. They were none too happy about that, thinking that maybe perhaps they had become a target themselves. This photograph is from a march, an anti-Olympics march that I was on. You can see some of the security officials. There were actually surface-to-air missiles up there with them in that tower. Because the private security firm, G4S, failed to follow through on its assigned duties to provide people to do security at the Olympics, they literally had to call the troops in. More people served in the Olympics who were members of the British military than were in Afghanistan at the time. And so you had this sort of military sheen at these Olympics as well. I mean, shoot, even their mascots looked a whole lot like two-legged surveillance cameras. <laughs> If you go to Russia, you saw the whip-wielding Cossacks attacking this group of activist artists called Pussy Riot. And so the repression was intense, not just in Russia, in pretty much every city that hosts the Olympics when the activists show up. These are some photographs I took in Rio. I lived in Rio as a Fulbright Research Fellow before and then during the 2016 Olympics. And they had double the number of security that they had in London. Another trend with Olympics, no matter where they're held, is you tend to see displacement and gentrification. The South Korea Olympics in Seoul in 1988 displaced some 800,000 people. Beijing, 2008, displaced 1.5 million people to make way for Olympic venues. This is a picture I took in Rio de Janeiro. This was a community called Vila Autodromo. 
and they had their community of around 300 families displaced to make way for a parking lot outside of the Olympic media venue and a new hotel that was built. You can see here, I'm standing with Eloisa Elena Costa Bertu. She and I gave talks uh, around Rio during this time. She was actually displaced from this community. I went back with her later. It was like an incredibly sad and moving moment where we looked through the fence, the chain link fence, at where her house once sat, and it was just a parking lot. And for Eloisa Elena, every story is different. So that's why I kind of wanted to put her on screen for a second because you can talk numbers all day long, but these trends that I'm talking about with the Olympics have real deal human effects. Eloisa Elena Costaberto was a practitioner of the Candomblé re religion, this Afro-Brazilian religion, and her orisha, or her goddess, was located on the water right in the Jacare Pagua Lagoon where she was living. So for her getting displaced to another part of the city wasn't just as easy as like putting her stuff in a bag and leaving. Not only was her social life overturned, but her spiritual life as well. In Rio de Janeiro, I worked with some women and we wrote about it with my writing colleague, Dave Zirin, about some women that were displaced, not only for the 2020 Olympics, but these same women were displaced by the 1964 Olympics in Tokyo. And they didn't want us to use their names because they feared retribution from the government. I wanna just make an extra point. A lot of times this displacement happens to public housing. So it becomes a way of getting rid of public infrastructure and replacing it with privatized, gentrified infrastructure. So where they lived in the Kasumigaoka apartment complex, that was a public housing unit. Another big trend is greenwashing, talking a big green game, making many promises about how the Olympics are gonna help jumpstart the improvement of material environmental gains without the actual follow through. This has become par for the Olympic course starting in the 1990s. They folded it into their rhetoric. Unfortunately, the rhetoric has not matched reality. Kind of striking example from 2012, they created a new category of sponsors called sustainability partners for those Olympics. <laughs> and they included groups that you might not think about with sustainability <laughs> such as BP, or EDF Energy, which is big into nuclear power, or car manufacturing companies like BMW. And it turns out, to become a sustainability partner, you didn't have to do anything. It was a pay-to-play charade that was uncovered by a nonprofit group in London. These are some photographs I took of this place in, um, it is this lagoon in Rio de Janeiro. And it was a place, it was called Guanabara Bay, where they were gonna host some of the events for the Olympics, including open water swimming. At the time, if you drank one teaspoon of the water from Guanabara Bay, you had a 99% chance of catching a virus. 99% chance. Now we know from coronavirus, just because you catch the virus in your system doesn't necessarily mean you emanate it. But suffice to say, the water was dirty. Rio organizers promised that if you give us the Olympics, we're gonna clean up Guanabara Bay, and by the time the games roll around, 80% of the water they promised would be filtrated. Well, unfortunately, that did not at all happen, and you can see there was garbage strewn everywhere. They put up these barriers that were supposed to stop the garbage, but they really weren't working, and as I say, about a quarter of the water flowing into this bay was actually filtrated and cleaned. So a promise to the people not followed through. If you're in a helicopter and you're looking at this picture, this was inside of the Olympic zone. There was a, a fencer from Great Britain who I've worked with um, who gave us tickets to attend the event. And he, so we were inside there. And you, if you were above, you might think this is a green space. But in reality, this was painted green cement. That, so I guess you could say they greened it up a little bit. In um, Pyeongchang, as I mentioned, they, built, they knocked down that forest, so the greenwashing there. This is a photograph I took in Tokyo, or actually in Fukushima, outside of Tokyo in 2019 when I was visiting there. These are these large stacks of what the locals called black pyramids because they're black garbage bags filled with soil and various stages of irradiation. And you would see like plants growing out of these things and then the wind would come and blow like the willows out of these plants, therefore spreading possible radiation even further. Total disaster. In fact, the people I interviewed in Japan said that 
Um, the Olympics actually slowed down the recovery, even though the Olympic organizers called it the recovery games. They said that hosting the Olympics was going to aid recovery. In fact, it did the opposite. It slowed it down because a lot of the cranes were actually in uh, Tokyo instead of Fukushima. Here you can see the Beijing Olympics. So they created ski runs in the Songshan Nature Reserve, putting into danger a number of animals that were already in danger. And in a place that's really a pretty temperate climate, so they had to manufacture snow on top of it, using precious water to create ski runs. There's been some really good academic work on this. And in fact, this is a study that I could point you to and send you if you'd like to see it later. The thing I would just highlight is if you look at the far right side of the graph, you can see that some of the worst culprits of greenwashing are some of the most recent Olympic Games. So they ha haven't actually gotten better at following through with their big promises around sustainability. And the last trend I'd like to talk about is corruption. Because there's so much money flowing through the Olympic system, it tends to sometimes flow into already pretty full pockets. You'll probably know about the Salt Lake City bribery scandal, where it turned out there was the Salt Lake City Organizing Committee was handing all sorts of money, tickets to National Basketball Association games, $500 violins, knee replacements for members of the IOC's family members, full scholarships for their family members to attend school, and they got caught. Funny thing, the Nagano Olympics that happened in 1998, they were doing the same thing, but they incinerated all their records, so we really don't have an idea of how much they were doing. Our friend John Coates, who I mentioned before, the big Australian Olympics honcho, also had a hand in this. Right before Sydney was voted in by a two-vote majority to get the 2000 Olympics there, he just gave, delivered $70,000 to the countries of two voting IOC members who then voted for Sydney and they won uh, in those games for 2000. Here's a picture of uh, Carlos Newsman who got caught with 16 gold bars in his posh Leblon uh, apartment in Rio de Janeiro. He had multiple passports, currencies, and, and multiple currencies. He is still listed as an honorary member at the International Olympic Committee although he has been sentenced to, to jail uh, for his illegal activities. And not to be outdone, Henry Kissinger, the human rights ogre who's turning 100 as we speak pretty much, <laughs> is an honor member of the International Olympic Committee. And should Henry Kissinger show up at the Olympics, uh, he could collect $450 a day per diem and therefore make more money sitting snoring in the fifth row of the diving competition than an Olympic medalist from many countries. Now, as I said, because of all these trends, it should come as no surprise that there's been a bunch of anti-Olympics activism. Boston, for example, was originally assigned the uh, position to, to be the, the candidate from the United States for the 2024 Olympics, but an activist movement cropped up and the city ended up saying no thanks. The mayor was put in a position where he had to say no to the Olympics and they kicked it over to Los Angeles, where immediately popped up this anti-Olympic group that I'll have something to say about in a minute, No Olympics LA. One thing that's interesting about activists today is it used to sort of be like activist whack-a-mole, where they'd pop up in the city, the Olympics would happen, then they'd go back to their regular activism. Nowadays, they're trying to sustain transnational activist linkages. This is a photo I took last summer in Paris at the second ever transnational anti-Olympic summit where activists from around the world came together to hold uh, knowledge sharing sessions, to hear from the voices of people who are negatively affected by the Olympics, did a toxic tour of greenwashing in Paris. This is a photograph I took in Tokyo at the first ever transnational anti-Olympic summit where they had the Olympic poverty torch that was created in Vancouver and it made its way to London, to activists around Sochi, Rio, Pyeongchang, and then to Tokyo, and so you can see them holding that Olympic poverty torch. It's made with a plunger, you can see, by, by a Vancouver activist. They continued their protest against the Sapporo Olympics, the bid for the Sapporo Olympics, and they've been pretty successful at staving them off. I went to numerous protests. That's what I pretty much did when I was in Rio, was following around activists. This is from uh, Vila Todromo. This is a play on words. It says Olympiada, which means Olympics, but Piada is joke, so the Olympics are a joke is the message. There was lots of activist nonprofits that were trying to raise up issues around the Olympics. 
Sochi, there wasn't that much protest inside of the country because it was very dangerous. But Russia had passed a draconian anti-LGBTQ law ahead of the Olympics. And you saw protests around the world protesting that. You did see the group I mentioned before, Pussy Riot, courageously showed up and protested in Sochi. And they were heavily repressed in the streets. This is a photo I took at the 2012 Olympics where activists from the Circassian population, a group of individuals who experienced a genocide some 150 years before the Sochi Olympics in the exact same area where those Olympics happened. This is a photo of greenwash activists in London. They held this greenwash gold campaign where they doused themselves with green custard. They were soon arrested by the police and they became known as the Custard Seven. And part of their bail conditions they were, though, that they couldn't attend any protests. But after the Olympics happened, their protests, uh, their charges were conveniently dropped. The Counter Olympics Network, which is a group that's still around, came out of the 2012 Olympics. Vancouver, just up the road from us in Seattle, had a strong indigenous flavor to the activism because they were being held on unceded native land. You saw a group called the Native Warrior Society who went up and stole the Olympic flag from the flagpole at City Hall and stood with it with their uh, Native Warrior Society flag there. Here's a photo I took of a mural that was very controversial. The government said that they had to take this mural down because one thing about the Olympics, they often pass city ordinances that squelch political freedom. In Vancouver, Canada, they passed an ordinance that said that you could not put signs up that were negative about the Olympics. Otherwise, they could have the authorities come and take that sign down, even if you put it up in your own private residence. So the zeitgeist is an, a global transnational anti-Olympics movement that's happening right now. And I think maybe leading into what I think Sean could talk ably about for sure is that we're also riding this sort of athlete activist zeitgeist right now, which seems like a real opportunity for us as people on the left who are thinking about how to organize against some of these depredations of mega events. This is Gwen Berry saying that she's an athlete activist. There's a rule inside of the Olympic Charter that says you cannot protest at the Olympics if you're an athlete, and yet that hasn't stopped people. Lawrence Halstead, the, the dashingly handsome fencer from <laughs> Team GB from Great Britain, has been outspoken about this. Faesa Lilesa, as he crossed the finish line, put his hands in a dissident symbol for the Oromo people of Ethiopia. At the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo, Raven Saunders, seen here while on the medal stand, rebuked that law on the charter and uh, said that this symbol of the X stood for all oppressed people around the world. Vladislav Heraskevich, the skeleton athlete from Russia, I'm sorry, from Ukraine, held up a sign that said no war in Ukraine, an obvious pointed phrase directed at Russia. He was not punished, by the way, which was kind of interesting. The, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, said it was a statement about human rights. And even recently, you've seen, just in the last week or so, an, an Olympian questioning the accessibility of the Olympics. The ticket prices are way out of the range of everyday working people. And this athlete, this Olympic athlete, said as much. So in closing, here you can see two of the Olympic power brokers from Los Angeles. Since we're in the United States, I just want to say this is a battle to keep an eye on. And maybe if you're feeling up to it and want to do it, support them. This is the Olympics, a bipartisan affair in the United States when they talk about Olympic costs in Los Angeles, which, by the way, have gone up from the initial bid phase, $5.3 billion, to now $6.9 billion and we're still way a ways off, and that doesn't count the security costs that President Trump here you can see signed on for. That should be in the two to three billion dollar range that aren't even counted in those costs. Eric Garcetti said that if we get the Olympics, we're gonna be able to get rid of homelessness by the time the Olympics roll around. That's definitely not happening in Los Angeles. No Olympics LA, you can see they've got a website and a lot of good information online. The battle continues in Los Angeles and around the world. And just to close, you know, just with Stuart Hall, it might seem like hegemony in the Olympics is pretty firm, but we're actually at a moment of extreme inst instability when it comes to this mega event. And so it seems like this is a, a time to say hegemony is definitely never forever. So thank you very much.
Um, I believe it was uh, the late uh, Mike Davis who had said about um, his 1990 book, um, what was the book of his that came out in 1990, the Hallmark one, not City Apology of Fear, but City of Quartz, mm -hmm. that he really saw his goal as a writer as being um, somebody who was trying to map systems of global hegemony and domination and capital onto the city of Los Angeles. Um, I want to speak really briefly about, I guess, a similar project in my own small way um, that I've you know, been embarking on for the last year and a half as a writer with the city of Seattle in specific. Um, I have a book that's coming out later on this year called Heartbreak City, um, Seattle Sports and the Unmet Promise of Urban Progress. Um, in which I'm really trying to go through all the way from the beginning um, of Seattle's history as a settler colony that was established in the mid 19th century, all the way down to the present and looking at how athletics in a lot of ways and sports really animate um, the best and worst of our politics as a city. Um, I chose Heartbreak City as a title, I think in a lot of ways because you know the obvious resonance with a lot of Seattle teams coming up short in the biggest moments. It's a very familiar history. I know um, if you're a Chicago sports fan, you know the, the, the salad days of the 1990s and, and Jordan and the Bulls notwithstanding. It's a really familiar history across cities. Um, but also because I think in the same way that, you know, romance in a lot of ways brings out the best and worst of a lot of people that we know, I think that our sports do something really, really similar uh, for our cities. I mean, you look at the city of Seattle, um, we are a city that I think was established in a lot of ways on the specious notion of settler grit, right? The fact that we have um, tall hills, one of which we're on right now, that were regraded as much as 55% uh, so that people could, you know, establish homes and roads and streetcars could go on them. Um, the fact that we have um, human made waterways like the Mont Lake Cut, right? Um, the drainage of Lake Union. These really kind of represent, in a lot of ways, um, the performance, I think, of a certain kind of settler um, resilience and a, a form of settler physicality that um, the city celebrates and has tried to celebrate repeatedly and I think is really core to how Seattle advertises itself. So I want to I take a few minutes to sort of walk through, I think, three broad silos that I think you can sort of track um, historically how Seattle sports are, are manifest. The first of these is advertising Seattle. Um, and how Seattle has used athletics to sort of advertise itself. Uh, the second of these is sports as a symbol of resistance. The, um, in many ways, victims are, I want to say, the people who have been on the losing end of um, Seattle's march to uh, capitalist supremacy, a project that's been going on for a century and a half now, um, for groups such as people of color, for laborers in the city, um, for disabled people in the city of Seattle. Um, sports have really represented a form of resistance and pushing back which I think is an important part of the story that we don't want to lose track of. Um, and the flip side of that in the third category, I think, is the way that um, conservatives in the city have used athletics to consolidate their power, right? Um, so when we, we look at the first of these, right, as far as talking about advertising Seattle, um, I was really, really happy to hear um, Cedric sort of bring up this idea of uh, what was going on in the city in the post 1980s years, where you have an era of deindustrialization cities like Seattle that were formally reliant on the tax revenues and huge tax bases that came from having um, pretty strong um, you know, industrial communities. Um, that feedback loop is broken um, with the onset of neoliberalism. And so you see really a lot of American cities, Seattle um, especially, embark on a series of cash grabs, um, part-time hustles, ways of sort of piecing together the solvency that used to be there from um, a more functioning um, a more functioning system of tax revenues. Um, one example that I try to highlight on this in, in my book is actually Seattle hosts the 1995 NCAA men's basketball Final Four um, in, in April of 1995. Um, at that point in time, it is really seen as an opportunity for Seattle to present itself on the global stage. Four years earlier, there was um, Goodwill Games that had taken place, the, the media mogul Ted Turner uh, chooses Seattle um, strategically as a city that seems blandly progressive, seems to have solved most of the big fights that a lot of other um, cities were, were, were um, going through as far as you know, crime, police brutality. Um, Seattle had sort of this, this nice seeming, very progressive, bland, uh, blandly appealing veneer that I think made it um, really an appealing piece of carry-in for a lot of global capitalists of various kinds, right? So 
Um, following from the Goodwill Games in 19, uh, I believe those took place in 1990, um, the final four games in 1995 um, become another opportunity for the city to showcase itself. But um, in order to do that, Seattle has to sort of wash away a lot of the problems that, um, and, and live up to this image that I think that um, it has on the global stage. And, and part of that involved um, arresting uh, demonstrators who were trying to stick up for the rights of, of houseless people in the city. There was a uh, demonstration that took place in Pioneer Square where the, uh, uh, the kingdom used to be located. Uh, rest in peace uh, for anybody who, who had, uh, had ever attended a, a game in that building, the concrete monstrosity that was the kingdom. Um, and 17 demonstrators who were trying to stick up for houseless residents were summarily um, arrested, right, before flashing news cameras in, in April of 1995. I think the project of using athletics to um, advertise Seattle as a progressive city goes actually much further back than the, t the, the late 20th century. It actually goes all the way back to the progressive era itself, um, where Seattle is trying to emerge um, from its earlier roughneck days as a, as a settler outpost. Um, city engineers and city bureaucrats discover really, really early that one of the ways that Seattle can sort of gain cultural legitimacy as a city is through outdoor play spaces and through outdoor parks, right? Um, at, a, at an earlier stage in the city's history, most of the city's parks were actually donated by pretty well-heeled aristocrats in the city. Um, in, a, in a rare act of civic um, forward thinkingness, um, it, you know, the consensus emerges that, you know, Seattle, if it's gonna be a serious city, can no longer sort of rely on the kindness of billionaires in order to provide recreation to people. We actually have to establish um, in the 1890s a parks department. And not only that, but we also have to fund it with a tax scheme I mean, not only that, but we also then have to go out and look at um, acquiring uh, new spaces of land that we can convert into a park space. One of those spaces, um, not too far from where we're sitting right now, is Cali Anderson Park, right? Which, um, in the in the early um, the early 1900s, um, I think it had formally gone by the title of Lincoln Park, um, not to be confused with the with with the band, of course. But um, you know, Seattle at that point in time. Um, while it's going out and acquiring and building a lot of these park spaces, it brings up the intended question of who are these going to be actually for, right? The Olmsted brothers who helped to design a lot of the city's park system um, were also strong proponents, proponents of policing. They believed that there needed to be a permanent police presence in Cal Anderson Park. Um, there were a number of um, uh, youths, integrated youths, actually black, Asian, white youths that played um, street baseball games. Um, in early 1904, there's a, a crime panic that breaks out around these games. People are saying that the youth are uh, miscreants. Some of them are skipping schools to play baseball games. Um, and so the Olmsted brothers really come out in favor of saying what we need to do is actually have a stronger police presence in these parks. While we're building up these parks, we have to make sure that the urban riffraff, as it were, are not able to um, sort of scare away some of the better healed residents of the city um, from being able to enjoy them. The problem with that is, at that point in the early Progressive Era, the Seattle Police Department was embroiled in a number of pretty nasty disputes. It was found that a number of um, city cops were, um, you know, found to have been um, trying to bribe um, saloons um, and for free booze down in, in Pioneer Square. In other instances, um, there were, um, you know, use of racial slurs. And so these really, really ugly um, headlines that I think the Seattle Police Department, again, in the early 20th century, um, that had followed the Seattle Police Department in the, early, in the early 20th century, sabotage attempts to cordon off Cal Anderson Park um, with the use of police presence. This is a story that we see played out, I think, pretty obviously in recent years, um, and I think speaks to um, just how core, um, you know, just how much I think our, our parks really animate a lot about the best and the worst of the city of Seattle. Um, at the same time that I think you see Seattle using sports to advertise itself um, to itself and also to the world as um, an, an opening and accepting an inclusive city, you also see a number of the groups that are on the, um, the short end of that stick using athletics to try to push back. I'm almost certain everybody here is familiar with the, the Rocky story, right? It's the, the story of um, um, an, a relatively unknown Philadelphia boxer who um, is white who challenges at that point in time the black heavyweight champion of the world, a fictionalized version of Muhammad Ali named um, Apollo Creed. Um, unbeknownst to many, that story is actually based somewhat on a sporting event that took place in Seattle. There was a local uh, white amateur by the name of Pete Rademacher who in 1957 after winning uh, the gold medal for boxing um, in the middle of the Cold War is really on one and says, I'm going, to, I'm going to go about trying to challenge the heavyweight champion of the world. Um, at that point in time was Floyd Patterson, a black man. 
Um, and he's able to find funding, backing, excitement, buzz from some of the most regressive aspects of society at that time. It's not only um, many white Seattleites that at that point in time, unfortunately, are cloistered into segregated neighborhoods in the city, would love to see the idea of a white local champion knocking uh, the chocolate champ, as it were, Floyd Patterson down a peg. You also see um, a lot of funding coming in from the Jim Crow South. I mean, this is a national story. It, it ends up um, in Seattle. This fight happens. It takes place here in August of 1957. Before the fight, Floyd Patterson says that this is a quintessential great white hope fight. There's no way you would be able to put up this much money for a, an unknown, a relatively unknown white challenger to defeat, at that point in time, the, the heavyweight champion of the world. Floyd Patterson says, I've never wanted to win a fight more in my life. The Seattle Post-Intelligencer Post does not print his remarks for fear that they would actually start a race riot on the, uh, the night of the fight. Um, and he ends up cleaning uh, a P. Rodemacher, Rodemacher's clock. I mean, he knocks him down seven times. Um, and there's, you know, Rodemacher's boxing career is not the only casualty of that night. There's actually a white a Seattle fan who gets so excited when uh, Rodemacher scores an unlikely knockdown in the first round, gets so excited, he has a heart attack and expires. Floyd Patterson actually fares much better um, than, the, than the deceased fan and goes on to win that bout. Um, when you go back and look at the footage of this, you really get a sense of how ugly a racial spectacle this was. Um, but you read the newspaper reports in Ebony Magazine, Jet Magazine, magazine as well, um, where for a lot of groups that were looking at um, heavyweight fighters at that point in time as really symbols of um, masculinity at the same time that a lot of black men are suffering very ugly and grisly police, um, uh, you know, ugly police violences at the hand of, um, you know, cops across the country. Um, many black men are sort of the first um, fired, last hired, and many of the sort of burgeoning industrial, um, you know, corporate vectors that sort of make up the, the great post-war consensus of, and the long economic boom. Um, in the middle of all of this, um, you know, black boxers in specific were a tremendous symbol of resistance for a lot of people, not only in the city of Seattle and beyond. And you see this in so many sports. I mean, in, in the post-World War II period, um, women and LGBTQIA plus um, bikers sort of laying claim to city space at that point in time um, were a tremendous symbol of resistance as well. Later on, you also look at the fact that there was a, uh, we were talking about this a little bit earlier as we you know, were getting ready to speak, the fact that there is a player strike that takes place in the National Football League um, in 1987. Um, across all, at that point in time, I believe it was 28 teams in the, in the National Football League. Um, for three weeks, games are played with scabs. Um, and Seattle is one of several cities where there is um, widespread picketing, um, of which our Central Labor Council, the, the MLK Labor Council, in addition to many individual unions, take place and, um, and let it be known that Seattle is not going to be a city that was actually friendly to um, scab labor of any kind, be it in football or um, in canneries or on shipyards. Um, so I think it, it really kind of folds back into remarks that were made earlier about sports being a site of resistance. The other side of that story, I think, is, is sport is a pretty clear avenue for conservatives in the urban context to try to consolidate a lot of their power, right? Um, in 1918, raise your hand if you knew this, we actually had a Ku Klux Klan baseball team uh, that played its games in broad daylight. Uh, night baseball was not um, regularly played in the United States until the 1930s, so these were games that took place. When you go back and read the, the newspaper accounts in 1918, games that took place is a Sunday matinee. Um, uh, the, the Klan baseball team, not a lot. We don't know a ton about the team. Um, we could imagine, I guess, what their, their uniforms may have looked like, um, but you know, not much is known about the team other than the fact that it actually existed, which I think says um, as much as, 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 as any historical factoid could. Um, the establishment of golf, golf courses in the 1920s, the, you know, the um, cordoning off of large swabs of, of urban space for a game played by um, a, a disproportionately um, pretty, pretty rich, um, but also small fan base in the urban context. Um, earlier in the, in, the, in the 20th century, there was sort of a push in the post four years to say that what we ought to be doing is trying to build as much housing in the city. There is a, a short-lived um, campaign, a build more homes campaign to try to have Seattle um, establish more homes for a lot of the returning vets and the families that they were trying to um, start in the aftermath of the war. By the time we get to the regressive 1920s, that push is very much a, um, a thing of the past as not only are segregated neighborhoods established across the city, I mean, Wallingford, 
uh, Columbia City, a segregated neighborhood, Green Lake, um, not to mention a lot of the east side suburbs as well. Um, but I think that golf was also very indicative of um, sort of a, a turn towards retrenchment that um, you saw after um, the, the earlier promise of the progressive era. Um, exclusive as that, is that, uh, that earlier push in the progressive era was, it actually did at least contain a lot of pretensions towards becoming a broader, more inclusive society that I think largely evaporates by the time we get to the 1920s. Um, all of us who are here, who are here, lived through um, the the uh, the the you know one-term Jenny's um, you know short stint as mayor of the city of Seattle. Um, Jenny Durkin was, I think, in a lot of ways, a historical echo of an earlier mayor that we had in the city's history. By the went by the name of Oli Hansen. Um, he was somebody who was your typical Red Scare crusader. When you go back and read uh, his 1920 memoir, it was titled Americanism versus Bolshevism. The word weak appears some uh, two dozen times to describe the various enemies that Ole Hansen had, had made and, and sought to elevate in his quest to turn um, Seattle as, you know, Seattle into sort of the, the urban metropolitan capital's lodestar, right? He called labor unions weak, he called labor bureaucrats weak, he called people that expected a, um, what we would call now a social safety net in the city of Seattle weak. And I seize on this because I think it's a really, really interesting um, use of sort of an athletic subtext to describe um, who he thought of as his enemies, right? Now, at the same time that he's, he's doing this, we have a socialist school board member by the name of Anna Louise Strong, as it turns out, um, who actually gets her start in politics um, as somebody who wants to bolster inclusivity in area parks. One of her first forms of, poli of um, political activism is trying to actually get more people to have access to trailheads in Mount Rainier and other area peaks at the point in time where Mount, mountaineering was very much, I think, very similar to golf, a sport that was um, implied a certain amount of mobility that I think came with, if not being rich, then certainly not being an ethnic minority in the city of Seattle. Um, Anna Louise Strong was somebody that believed that the promise of, of all of our parks and everything that we had to offer as far as outdoor spaces should be open to everybody. That dovetails um, almost seamlessly into her later career as somebody who um, was really um, kind of our, our own local version of a Eugene Debs, a socialist agitator who says, um, we need to elevate the struggle of the Seattle general strike. Um, we don't know where this experiment is going to head, but we know that one of the ways that Seattle can actually make a global reputation is not through some of the same conservative um, politics that I think Ole Hansen was trying to elevate, but actually as a site of resistance. Um, the Seattle general strike um, you know, only lasts about a week or so, Anna Luisa's career as a, as a socialist agitator goes on for several decades after that. Um, and I, you know, the note that I think I want to end my, my you know, part of this remarks on before we get into questions is just highlighting the fact that she was somebody that actually thought that sports was really going to be the avenue through which um, Seattle was going to make a name as a site of resistance. She was somebody who, every, you know, with everything that we're talking about, she was somebody who thought that um, you know, athletics was not a, a form of escapism. It was not going to be the way that um, you know, it was not something that we wanted to leave up to um, our class enemies, as it were, to sort of define. Um, it was something that we could actually lay claim to as leftists as well. And I think that's a really important um, legacy and a really important lesson to, to remember and, and keep alive um, here in the 21st century, a century after um, Anna Luisa Strong's uh, career as a political agitator. So um, I guess we're going to open it up to questions at this point, or I don't know how, what our format from this point forward is going to be. Uh,